the inaugural Joseph C. Memorial Lecture, and I definitely want to thank the Center for establishing this lecture series in Joe's memory. Joe was a valued friend, uh, an esteemed colleague, and an incomparable scholar who had was taken from our midst much earlier than he should have been. Uh, the two of us shared many memorable times together over the years. Uh, most recently, just a year ago, at a colloquium in his honor at Harvard University, where some of his former graduate students engaged us with the kind of presentations that stimulate the mind and gladden the heart. When I recall other memorable occasions in Joe's company, I have to mention the times that we reveled together in 2001 and 2002 in the cave of various wineries around Avignon, especially the Domaine Paul Hotel and the Chateau Beaucastel, tasting marvelous bottles of Côte du Cologne and Chateau Neuf du Pape. And two years ago, when we had lunch together on the banks of one of Lyon's canals, on an exquisite early summer uh, day. Uh, the pleasure of Joe's company stemmed not only from his obvious joie de vivre, and it was quite a joie de vivre, I can assure you, but also from the fact, as he said on several occasions, the two of us were good intellectual sparring partners because of the different perspectives we brought to our work. Uh, those perspectives were made explicit one day over lunch at an excellent restaurant in Avignon. I think you can detect a theme here. <laughs> when he asked me about my background, when I told him that I had grown up overseas and been trained initially in anthropology, he promptly explained, oh, now I know what you do, why you do what you do. When I asked him the same question, he replied that he had an MBA. Whereupon I responded, oh, and now I know why you do what you do. <laughs> As Joe demonstrated time and again, a salient feature of his career was his insatiable drive to understand the origins, nature, and dynamics of the human experience with slavery. Although trained as an Africanist, Joe became increasingly interested in slavery elsewhere in the world in the course of his long and distinguished career. The last years of his life found him participating enthusiastically in conferences on slaving and slavery in some very non-African places, including the Black Sea region, East and Southeast Asia, and the Indian Ocean, a part of the globe in which I like to think I helped to interest him, given my frequent assertions that it had been proven scientifically that the Mare Indicum is indeed the center of the historical universe. Whether I actually did so, of course, ultimately is of no consequence. What is important is that Joe knew that we must not only talk about slavery as a multi-dimensional dimensional global phenomenon, but also reevaluate how we approach and conceptualize the complex human experience with chattel and related forms of bonded and coerced labor. It is with these general observations in mind that I would like to offer you some thoughts about slave, convict, and indentured labor, and the need to transcend what I have characterized on previous occasions as the, quote, tyranny of the particular, close quote, in slavery and cognate labor studies. The publication in 1969 of Philip Curtin's classic census of the Atlantic slave trade inaugurated a revolution in our understanding of how and why some 12.5 million enslaved African men, women, and children were exported to the Americas between 1500 and the 1860s. Even the most cursory survey of the now massive slavery bibliography, which runs to more than 25,000 entries, that Joe began some 35 years ago reveals that the last half century has witnessed a dramatic explosion in our knowledge about the African diaspora to the New World and slavery in Sub-Saharan Africa. This research, in turn, has spurred ever greater interest in the development of an Atlantic, quote, world, close quote, that bound Western Europe, West and West Central Africa, and the Americas together in increasingly complex social, economic, cultural, and political relationships between the 16th and 19th centuries. While there can be little doubt that this scholarship has added immeasurably 
to our understanding of slaving and slavery in Africa and the Americas, an unfortunate consequence has been what Edward Elpers aptly characterized in 1997 as, quote, the tyranny of the Atlantic, close quote, in slavery studies in general. Preoccupied with reconstructing the movement and lives of the millions of men, women, and children enslaved in Africa and transported across the Atlantic, historians have often ignored slaving and slavery elsewhere, especially in the Indian Ocean world and Asia. At the heart of this Atlantic centrism is a reluctance to acknowledge a number of historical realities that millions of men, women, and children have been held in bondage and trafficked elsewhere than Africa and the Americas since the early 16th century, and of course much before then, that transatlantic slave trading in the modern indicum was a far greater antiquity than it was in the Atlantic, that the Indian Ocean trades continued to funnel hundreds of thousands of Africans to the Middle East and India after 1500, and last but far from least, that the history of South Africa and the Mascarene Islands of Mauritius and the Union demonstrate slaves flowed toward Africa from India, Southeast Asia, and China, as well as away from the continent. Even when historians have acknowledged the existence of these Indian Ocean trades, they frequently discount their role in connecting the disparate parts of this geographically vast and culturally complex world, oceanic world, or their importance in our understanding slavery as a global phenomenon. Similar observations can be made about scholarship on the indentured labor trades that flourished in the wake of slave emancipation in the British Empire in 1834. Just as Curtin's pioneering work revolutionized slavery studies, so the publication of Hugh Tinker's A New System of Slavery, the Export of Indian Labor Overseas, 1830 to 1920, in 1974, spurred considerable interest in reconstructing the lives of the more than 3.7 million Africans, Chinese, Indians, Japanese, Javanese, Melanesians, and other non-European peoples who migrated throughout and beyond the colonial plantation world between the mid-1830s and the early 1920s to work under either written or oral contracts. As in slavery studies, scholarship on this, quote, great experiment, close quote, with the use of free labor, emphasizes the role that Britain and the Caribbean play in this system's development and history, despite incontrovertible evidence that its origins are to be found in the Indian Ocean. That, as I. M. Cumston pointed out 66 years ago, Mauritius was the crucial test case for the large-scale use of free Asian agricultural labor in the post-emancipation colonial plantation world, and that the number of indentured laborers under written contracts who reached European colonies in the Indian Ocean exceeded those who arrived in the Caribbean by almost 260,000, a figure which soars to more than 1.5 million if we include those who worked under short-term oral contracts. This Atlantic centrism is emblematic of what I believe is a larger problem in slavery and cognate labor studies namely a, quote, tyranny of the particular, by which I mean a preoccupation with the specific, with the particular, and an attendant unwillingness to look beyond the confines of the specialized case studies that are a trademark of slavery and cognate labor studies and examine these various trades and systems in more fully developed local, regional, pan-regional, and comparative contexts. A classic manifestation of this historiographical particularism is the propensity to draw a sharp dividing line between the pre- and post-emancipation eras in the colonial, <coughs> European colonial world. Studies of British slave colonies usually, for example, come to an end with slave emancipation in 1834, or occasionally with the demise of the so-called apprenticeship system in 1838, while studies of post-emancipation indentured labor systems in these very same colonies 
pay little, if any, substantive attention to the slavery regimes that preceded them, despite widespread acceptance of Tinker's notion that indentured labor was essentially, quote, a new system of slavery. This system's demise in the 1920s in, is, in turn, often viewed as ending the last major chapter in the human experience with bonded or coerced labor migration, an assumption that the movement of hundreds of thousands of Bangladeshi, Indian, Filipino, and other Asian contract laborers to places such as the Persian Gulf during the late 20th and early 21st centuries necessarily calls into question. The consequences of this chronological apartheid include a propensity to regard these labor systems as separate and distinct phenomena unto themselves, a perspective that necessarily limits our ability to reconstruct the lives of the millions of individuals who participated in them. That hundreds of thousands of indentured Africans, Chinese, Indians, and Javanese who replaced slaves in the Caribbean cane fields never figure in discussions about the Atlantic world must, to my mind, raise questions about this concept's analytical viability and value after the mid-1830s, if not perhaps even before that. In short, did an Atlantic world that had existed for two centuries or more somehow cease to exist during the mid-19th century highly improbable, highly unlikely, or do we need to think of it as something that was transformed in ways that we have yet to explore, much less understand? The tyranny of the particular also underpins the tendency to view the Atlantic, Indian Ocean, and Pacific worlds as self-contained units of historical analysis. There can be little doubt that viewing oceanic basins as distinctive zones of biological, cultural, and economic integration and interaction can be a valuable heuristic tool to bring large-scale historical processes into sharper relief. However, as the debates initiated by the William and Mary Quarterly's 2006 forum on conceptualizing the Atlantic world and reassessments of traditional approaches to transnational labor migration indicate, Defining such oceanic worlds largely, if not exclusively, in geographical terms can also impede a fuller understanding of the ways in which they interacted or were connected with one another. Research by scholars such as Marcel van der Linden on the Dutch East India Company's multinational labor force, Philip J. Stern on the politics and ideology of the early British East India Company state, Carl Nightingale, on the geography of color lines in Madras and New York, David Lambert and Dave Alan Lester on the geographies of cultural, pardon me, colonial philanthropy and British imperial career, Zoe Laidlaw on transoceanic humanitarian and moral reform programs, Karen Speedy on Reunion's role in the development of the so-called Blackbird trade of Melanesians to New Caledonia and Queensland and Lori Wood on legal institutions and personnel in the 18th century French colonial empire demonstrates that we ignore the complex, multifaceted movement of information, ideas, and people within and between these oceanic realms at our peril. Recent scholarship on slave trading and abolitionism in the Indian Ocean highlights the need for historians of slavery and cognate labor systems to step away from this preoccupation with the particular. This research demonstrates, for example, that we must now view European slave trading and abolitionism as truly global phenomena, that the late 18th and early 19th centuries witnessed an increasingly interconnected movement of slave, convict, and indentured laborers throughout the colonial world and the developing a fuller understanding of the slave, abolitionist, and indentured experience, both locally, regionally, and globally, is contingent upon asking hitherto unanswered questions 
and engaging with topics and issues that may sometimes seem, at least at first glance, to be marginal, if not perhaps even irrelevant, to the study in question. What we now know about the origins of the slaves who reached British East India Company possessions between the 1620s and the 1770s, and the French-controlled masquerines between the 1670s and the early 1830s, leaves little doubt about the global dimensions of European slave trading. East India Company ships transported slaves from the Cape Verde Islands, West Africa's Gold Coast, Cabinda in West Central Africa, Madagascar, Mozambique, the Comoros, India's Coromandel and Malabar coasts, and the Indonesian islands of Java and Nias, throughout a far-flung commercial empire which reached from St. Helena in the South Atlantic to India and the Indonesian archipelago. Mauritius and Réunion housed cattle laborers drawn from a catchment area that extended from West African ports such as Gorée and Rida eastward to southern China. Early 19th century sources record the presence on the island of West Africans described as Bambaras, Guineans, and Wolofs, of men, women, and children from no fewer than 14 populations in eastern and southeastern Africa that can be identified with certainty, some of which were located as far away as modern Malawi and eastern Zambia of individuals from 13 ethno-cultural populations on Madagascar, of Abyssinians from the Horn of Africa and Arabs from the Persian Gulf, of Indians from Bengal, Goa, and the subcontinent's Tamil and Telugu-speaking populations, of Malays from the Malay Peninsula and the Indonesian islands of Bali, Makassar, Java, Nias, Sumatra, and Timor, and last but far from least, of men and women who clearly came from China. This multi-directional and pan-regional traffic consumed hundreds of thousands of souls. A review of published scholarship indicates that British, Dutch, French, Portuguese, and other Europeans exported a minimum of 450,000 to 565,000 slaves from Eastern Africa, Madagascar, India, and Southeast Asia to European administrative centers, factories, and colonies within the Indian Ocean basin between 1500 and 1850, a figure which future research will undoubtedly revise upward. Europeans also shipped hundreds of thousands of slaves from southeastern Africa and elsewhere in this Indian, this oceanic basin, such as India, to the Americas, and from eastern Africa, South Asia, and Southeast Asia to China, Japan, and the Philippines, from whence, as Tatiana Sejas has demonstrated, some thousands were subsequently shipped across the Pacific to Mexico on the Manila Galleon. When viewed in its totality, the data currently at our disposal indicate that Europeans traded a minimum of 954,000 to 1.276 million slaves within and beyond the Indian Ocean Basin between 1500 and 1850, with much of this activity concentrated in the years between 1700 and 1850. Contemporary sources confirm the complexities of the European Indian Ocean trades in other ways. The statements that ship captains filed with Admiralty and colonial officials upon arriving at Paul Louis Mauritius and documents preserved in the Mauritian notarial record attest to the various ways and extent to which European Indian Ocean and Atlantic slave trades were intertwined with one another. The masquerine trade, for example, involved American, Brazilian, Portuguese, and Spanish, as well as Arab, probably Omani, Indian, and metropolitan French and colonial masquerine mercantile interests. Merchants based in Bordeaux, Lorient, Marseille, Nantes, Saint-Malo, and other ports many of whom had been and or continued to be involved in the transatlantic slave trade, 
underwrote large numbers of slaving ventures to the Western Indian Ocean, at least 282 of which are known to have involved the masquerines in one way or another. And again, additional research will no doubt increase this number. The seamless quality of European slave trading between these oceanic worlds is likewise illustrated by the advent in the mid-1790s of a decade-long commercial relationship between Mauritius and the Rio de la Plata that entailed the exchange of African slaves, exotic tropical exports, and contraband merchandise shipped, secured by uh, masquerine privateers for American silver and foodstuffs. These sources also reveal that the different European trades did not function in isolation from one another but could be intertwined even more intimately in various ways. In 1654, for example, Venkata, a Brahmin merchant in the East India Company's service at Madras, was fined 16 pagodas uh, for facilitating the sale of enslaved Indian children to Dutch brokers at nearby Pulikat. Uh, little seems to have changed 140 years later when the British governor at Madras complained about the assistance that the Dutch at Poulicot were offering French slavers seeking human cargoes destined for the masquerines. The late 18th and early 19th centuries likewise found masquerine-based merchants and ship captains engaging with Indian merchants in Portuguese Goa and with Gujarati merchants and Portuguese officials and merchants in Mozambique to supply the islands with African slaves. The number of slaves traded by Europeans in the Maori Indicum obviously pales in comparison to the 12 million men, women, and children exported from West and West Central Africa to the Americas between 1500 and the 1860s. These Indian Ocean trade significance cannot be assessed, however, only in terms of the number of men, women, and children caught up in them. To do so is to ignore the larger context within which these trades occurred and of which they were an integral part, the ways in which these trades changed through time, and their regional and pan-regional impact. Adding the number of slaves exported to the Mascarines, to those carried away from Western Africa by French slavers, for example, increases the total volume of the French slave trade between 1640 and 1848 by 28 or 29 percent over current estimates of 1.25 to 1.38 million. The masquerine trade also became increasingly important to French slaving interests during the late 18th and early 19th centuries, accounting for approximately 25 percent of all French exports between 1770 and 1810, and more than 40% of all such exports between 1811 and 1848. Europeans likewise accounted for an ever larger percentage of the increasing number of slave exports from Eastern Africa into the wider Indian Ocean world between the 17th and 19th centuries. British, Dutch, French, and Portuguese traders consume somewhere between 25 and 39 percent of perhaps as many as 165,000 such exports during the 16th, pardon me, the 17th century. 37 to 52 percent of as many as 833,000 such exports during the 18th century. And 58 to 66 percent of perhaps as many as 1 million such exports between 1800 and 1873. Information on these trades' economic impact remains frustratingly sparse, but a sense of their possible importance is suggested by estimates that the masquerine trade alone injected somewhere between 7.5 and 11 million piastres. Now, a piastre, of course, is a Spanish dollar. Uh, into the Western Indian Ocean economy between 1770 and the 18, early 1830s, at least one-third of which was in the form of silver coin, which, as Pedro Machado has pointed out, contributed to Gujarati bankers' ability to discount 
the bills of exchange that were crucial to commercial activity throughout this region. The historical significance of these trades is made manifest in other ways. Although only 24,000 Indian slaves may have been exported to the Mascarenes between 1670 and the 1790s, this traffic laid the structural foundations upon which the exportation of hundreds of thousands of indentured Indian laborers during the 19th century rested. The 3,000 to 3,200 Indian laborers who reached La Union in the late 1820s, for example, did so from the former slave trading enclaves of Pont de Chaby, Tarikal, and Yanam on India's Coromandel coast. Pont de Chaby and Tarikal, I should note, would also figure prominently in the migration of at least 79,000 indentured Indians to Réunion, French Guiana, Guadeloupe, and Martinique between 1849 and the mid-1880s. The existence of such links between the slave and indentured trades should, in one sense, come as no great surprise to us. French scholars have explored the ways in which the engagé system, which entailed the recruitment of some 50,000 ostensibly liberated slaves and free contractual laborers from eastern Africa and Madagascar to work on Mayotte in the Comoros, the island of Nosy Bay off Madagascar's northwest coast, and Réunion following the abolition of slavery in the French Empire in 1848 functioned. Additional evidence of such links comes from India. In her seminal article on slavery and agricultural labor in southern India, published 52 years ago, Benedicta Hedgema argued that the recruitment of some indentured Indian laborers cannot be explained without reference to indigenous systems of slavery within India, and that a significant number of the migrant laborers who reached Ceylon between 1848 and 1873 came from amongst the ranks of South India's cradial or agricultural laborers, our slaves. Recent research supports her argument. Reports on slavery in the Madras Presidency in 1819 noted that landowners in some of the Presidency's districts had a free hand in disposing of their servile dependents if they wished to do so. While Mauritian immigration registers confirm that individuals of slave caste status, usually described as either pariah or pulaya, reached the island during the late 1830s. The presence of Danghars, or tribal hill peoples, among early indentured populations points as well to the ways in which the slave and indentured trades could be interconnected. Assamese and Nepalese hill tribesmen were enslaved with some regularity in the late 18th and early 19th century a development which raises the question of whether such individuals became part of a system in which coercive labor re recruitment practices were common, especially during its early years. The possible scale of this activity is suggested by the fact that approximately one-third of the 7,000 Indians who arrived in Mauritius during 1837-38 were identified as Daimhars from Bihar's Chota Nagpur Plateau, and by assertions that tribal peoples comprised more than 13% of the 374,000 indentured Indians who reached Mauritius between 1834 and 1870. That the Chota Nagpur Plateau also supplied 250,000 of an estimated 700 to 750,000 migrant workers for Assam's tea plantations during the second half of the 19th century underlines the need to explore possible links between the slave and or indentured labor trades and the internal migrant labor networks in which in early colonial India described by scholars such as Raji, Ravi Ahuja and Ian Kerr. Recent scholarship on abolitionism in the Indian Ocean similarly highlights that students of slavery and cognate labor systems 
must move beyond their preoccupation with the particular. This work reveals that abolitionists clashed repeatedly with slaving interests in both the Indian Ocean and the Atlantic, and moreover, that abolitionist endeavors in the Mara Indicum often predated those in the Atlantic. The first manifestation of such activity dates to 1774, when Governor General Warren Hastings and his council issued regulations to control slave trading in Bengal on the grounds that, quote, the practice of stealing children from their parents and selling them for slaves has long prevailed in this country and has greatly increased since the establishment of the English government in it. So great was this problem, Hastings opined, that, quote, there appears no probable way of remedying this calamitous evil, but that of striking at the root of it and abolishing the right of slavery altogether, excepting such cases to which the authority of government cannot reach, close quote. With this thought in mind, Hastings and his council also mandated that henceforth, quote, the right of masters over their slaves should not extend beyond the first generation, close quote. These sentiments reappeared during the second half of the 1780s. While the reasons for this renewed company interest in abolitionism remain unclear, there can leave me little doubt about its historical significance. On July 22nd, 1789, 18 years before the abolition, parliamentary abolition of the British slave trade, the Calcutta presidency and the exportation of slaves from its territories on the grounds that this trade was contrary to, quote, the dictates of humanity, close quote. The Madras presidency followed suit nine months later for exactly the same reason. The same principle, this notion of acting consistent with the dictates of humanity, also prompted attacks on the institution of slavery itself long before slave emancipation became the focal point of abolitionist agitation in the Atlantic. In March 1786, Acting Governor General McPherson and his council proposed to emancipate all company slaves at Ben Coulin, the company's factory on the west coast of Sumatra, and turn these new freedmen into wage laborers and independent pepper planters. Three and a half years later, Governor General Cornwallis informed London just a week and a half after banning slave exports from the Calcutta presidency that he was formulating a plan to abolish slavery throughout all of the company's Indian territories, a plan which the company's directors replied that they were looking forward to receiving with considerable anticipation. Such abolitionist undertakings continued well into the 19th century. Early in 1800, the company's directors ordered the implementation of what proved to be a short-lived experiment to free company slaves on St. Helena. That same year, the government of Ceylon issued a proclamation regulating domestic slavery on the island and prohibiting slave imports and exports. In 1805, Penang's lieutenant governor proposed abolishing slavery at that settlement on the grounds that slavery was, quote, the greatest of all evils and the attempt to regulate such an evil is in itself almost absurd, close quote. His proposal, incidentally, met with the company's approval. Eight years later, Sir Stanford Raffles recommended the immediate emancipation of all government-owned slaves on Java following that island's capture of the Dutch. In 1816, Ceylon's governor forwarded a plan to London to declare all slave children born after the Prince Regent's birthday later that year to be free. The 18-teens and 1820s also witnessed significant attempts to suppress illegal slave trading in the Western Indian Ocean, especially to the Masquerades. Colonial and vice admiralty courts in Mauritius, for example, condemned 49 captured slave ships carrying more than 3,500 men, women, and children between 1812 and 1825. The number of such adjudications exceeded those handled by the mixed or joint anti-slave trade commissions 
at Rio de Janeiro and Suriname between 1819 and 1845, and almost equaled the number of cases dealt with in Havana during the same period. While the question of whether these endeavors were little more than pale reflections of metropolitan interests and activities or major developments in their own right, which shaped British, which shaped abolitionist thought in Britain and imperial policy and practice in the Atlantic remains unanswered. It is clear that the forces of abolitionism in these two oceanic worlds engaged in a complex dialogue that cannot be ignored whenever the origins and dynamics of British and French abolitionism are discussed. That those at the highest echelons of the British government were aware of the East India Company's abolitionist policies and practices is illustrated compellingly by the fact that the members of the Board of Control, which supervised the company's civil, financial, and military affairs after 1784, who gave final governmental approval to the 1786 proposal to emancipate Ben Coolen's slaves, included Prime Minister William Pitt the Younger. Henry Dundas, who would play a prominent role in defeating the 1792 parliamentary bill to abolish the British slave trade, and William Grenville, on whose watch as Prime Minister between 1806 and 1807, Parliament finally abolished the British slave trade, of course, in 1807. On at least three occasions during the 18-teens, no less a person than the Prince Regent, the future George IV, was briefed on attempts to suppress the illegal slave trade to Mauritius. He would also prove strongly of the 1816 proposal to have Selenese slave owners voluntarily manumit their slave children, and following his accession to the throne in 1820, of legislation to emancipate all female slave children of certain castes in that colony. The late 18th and early 19th centuries would also find the British making increasing use of convict labor. The Dutch East India Company had pioneered the use of such labor in the Indian Ocean when it sent Selenese, Chinese, and Japanese, pardon me, Japanese prisoners to the Cape of Good Hope within several years of that colony's establishment in 1652, a practice that the company continued well into the 18th century. The British themselves were no strangers to relying upon such labor having transported 50,000 convicts to their American colonies between 1718 and 1775. The transportation of Indian convicts to British possessions in the Indian Ocean began in 1787, the same year, coincidentally, in which the first of more than 160,000 convicts who reached Australia between 1788 and 1868 left Britain and ultimately some 108,000 Indian and Southernese convicts would reach the Andaman Islands, Ben Coolin, Burma, Malacca, Mauritius, Penang, and Singapore, mostly between the late 1780s and the 1860s. Contemporary sources reveal the various ways in which this migrant labor system was bound up with slavery, abolitionism, and indentured labor by the fact that the very first Indian convicts to reach Ben Coolin did so just a year after the 1786 proposal to emancipate the settlement's slaves. By a British district official in Bengal, arguing in 1798 that sending Indian convicts to Trinidad could help to undermine the transatlantic slave trade to that island by creating an independent class of husbandmen by Mauritian Governor Robert Farquhar's report that Indian convict labor had benefited both the island slaves and planters, and local, that local Maranage tax revenues were being used to cover the cost of feeding, lodging, and guarding these convicts. And by Claire Anderson's perceptive and compelling analysis of the similar ways in which British colonial officials thought about and processed Indian convicts and indentured laborers during the early 19th century. 
To argue that historians of slavery and indentured and convict labor must shake off the tyranny of the particular is, in certain respects, to challenge decades of accepted historical practice and wisdom. At a minimum, to do so is to invite contentious debate with those committed to viewing the human experience with coerced and bonded labor through specific sets of lenses. Evidence of such commitments is not hard to find. The argument that American-derived definitions of slave status are unsuitable to understanding slavery in sub-Saharan Africa, the Indian Ocean, and Asia, for example, elicited an impassioned rejection of any such notion from many of the African and other historians who attended the 2008 conference in Zanzibar on the Indian Ocean world as a cultural continuum. Similar observations can be made about indentured labor studies, where the Tinkerian paradigm's dominance manifests itself in the historiographical obsession, and I do believe it is an obsession, with labor recruitment, control, resistance, and accommodation to the exclusion of other equally, if not ultimately more important, aspects of indentured workers' lives and history. As I tell my undergraduate students at some point every semester, if we are honest with ourselves, we will admit that we would prefer to lead lives that are relatively simple and straightforward, if not predictable. Many people are accordingly hesitant to engage with the messiness that invariably accompanies complexity. We historians are, in our own way, not all that much different. Our emphasis on establishing more or less clearly de delineated geographical, chronological, topical, and conceptual parameters to the research projects which are the lifeblood of what we do, first as graduate students, and then as academics rushing to publish the articles, monographs, and edited collections that are the stuff of job offers, tenure, and promotion, suggest that we too are often hesitant to delve as fully as we might into the complexities of the human experience especially the highly emotive and often problematic experience with slavery and cognate forms of labor. The question before us then is, what can we do to expand our knowledge and understanding of the global slaveries and associated labor systems that engross our interest? Let me suggest that there are at least two ways we can do so. The first is to pay careful attention to what our sources have to tell us and to be prepared to follow the paths that they may unexpectedly reveal to us. In my own case, this has uh, led to an emphasis that we must pay due attention to the role that children play in shaping abolitionist discourse, policy, and practices. They're left out of the equation entirely. It has also entailed exploring the East India Company's commitment to, quote, the dictates of humanity in ways that at first glance seem to have little bearing on ending the enslavement and exportation of Indian children and ultimately the institution of slavery itself. The result of this unexpected, and I should add ongoing, engagement is that I now know more about famine relief, orphanages, female lunatic asylums, native hospitals, public dispensaries, and smallpox vaccination than I ever imagined I would, and have moreover been compelled to reassess the nature dynamics, and impact of company humanitarian policies and practices. The second way is to expand our knowledge, to expand our knowledge and understanding brings me back to my observation at the beginning of these remarks, that the last five decades have witnessed a revolution in slavery and cognate labor studies, 
a revolution that has created a massive body of scholarship that, at least to my mind, often remains underutilized. There are relatively few aspects of the slave, convict, and indentured experience in some part of the world that someone hasn't already written something about somewhere, a historiographical reality which mandates that we must set about the business of more consciously contextualizing our research as fully as possible, locally, regionally, pan-regionally, and comparatively. I appreciate the difficulties of doing so, especially attempting to put our work in broader comparative contexts. But 45 years as an Indian Oceanist convinces me that the future of slave and cognate labor studies in an ever increasingly globalized world will ultimately depend on our ability to explain convincingly to people, be they university administrators, politicians, business leaders, and the average man and woman in the street, why they should be interested in what we do and why what we do is important. It is with that thought in mind that I hope you will join me when, after a hard day of frolicking at the archives, I return home, assume the lotus position favored by practitioners of historical yoga, and begin to intone that most sublime of all mantras, contextualization. 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 Thank you very much.